The flavors that survive heat are sweet and sour. That's why both crisp and slightly sweet wines can cool the palate after a fiery onslaught. So you think about wines like Riesling and Muscat, especially those from cool climates like Germany, Canada, Alsace, where the wine preserves its refreshing acidity. These wines are the equivalent of diving into the ocean after getting a sunburn, invigorating and soothing for your tongue. Long after you've swallowed, their silver thread of acidity lasts as long as that hot wire of spice in your mouth. They also have complementary aromas and flavors of spices, limes, lemons, green apples, and flowers. Think about the garnishes that often tame the heat in spicy dishes. You'll find those aromas in the wines that go best with them. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 44. I have some delicious wine topics to chat with you about in today's Unreserved Wine Talk podcast, including how do you pair wine in spicy dishes, especially those with a lot of heat, like Tex-Mex or Vindaloo chicken? Why are Gen Xers so different as wine drinkers than millennials, and how is marketing to them changed? And how can you improve your blood pressure and lower your risk of Alzheimer's with wine? I'll include links to my pairing tips, the wines that I recommend for spicy dishes, the article on marketing wine to Gen X, and the research study in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 44. In my Get Wine Smart course that's relaunching soon, I take an even deeper dive into spicy food and wine pairing. I cannot wait to share this with you soon. Before we dive in, I'd like to share a spotlight on a member of our podcast community with you. Hope from Jordan Provisions in California posted this on Facebook, quote, Hello, Natalie. I look forward to your podcasts. Thanks so much for sharing your knowledge with me and so many others. Kindest regards, Hope, end quote. Well, Hope, I'm so glad you enjoyed it, and I'm sending you a copy of my Ultimate Food and Wine Pairing Guide. I'm sure you'll find it a handy reference when you're deciding on which wine to drink with your meal, spicy or not. If you'd like a free copy of my Ultimate Food and Wine Pairing Guide, just email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com and let me know what you like about the podcast and what I can do to improve it for you. If you're listening to this podcast on the day it's published, I'd like to invite you to join me for a live video chat on Facebook this evening at 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll tackle questions like, how can you pair wine with Thanksgiving turkey and all the side dishes? What is the new defect in wine called mouse, and what does it smell like? And which wine trends should you absolutely ignore? You'll find me at 7 p.m. this evening, live at nataliemcclain.com forward slash Facebook. Pour yourself a glass of wine and join in the chat or just sit back and watch. All right, let's dive into our topics today. I'm going to take a sip of my Pinot Noir from Queenston, pronounced Queenston, like Downton Abbey. There's no W. Our first topic of the evening. I used to find it just really, really tough to pair wine with spicy dishes because the heat and the spice of many dishes, when you're talking pad thai, jalapeno stuffed burritos, Indian tandoori, Texas barbecue, Cajun crabs and gumbo, Szechuan, Kung Pao pork or Jamaican jerk chicken, 
Well, those are all cuisines that did not develop alongside regional wines over the centuries, as did European fare. And trying to find wines that will complement food that is all at once sweet, sour, and spicy can be a challenge, but you do not have to cry in your beer <laughs> or drink beer. So I'm going to have some suggestions for you here, some specific suggestions. First of all, the flavors that survive heat are sweet and sour. That's why both crisp and slightly sweet wines can cool the palate after a fiery onslaught. So you think about wines like Riesling and Muscat, especially those from cool climates like Germany, Canada, Alsace, where the wine preserves its refreshing acidity. These wines are the equivalent of diving into the ocean after getting a sunburn, invigorating and soothing for your tongue. Long after you swallow, their silver thread of acidity lasts as long as that hot wire of spice in your mouth. They also have complementary aromas and flavors of spices, limes, lemons, green apples, and flowers. Think about the garnishes that often tame the heat in spicy dishes. You'll find those aromas in the wines that go best with them. With mildly spicy dishes, you can drink dry whites like New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, Australian Riesling, Italian Pinot Grigio, Alsatian Pinot Blanc. Their herbal aromas work well with the ingredients in curries, green curries especially, such as basil or basil, tarragon, coriander, lemongrass, and lime. For hotter dishes, such as pad thai, mustard-based fare, wasabi, which is green horseradish paste, hot, 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 Cajun, from the Nova Scotia Acadians who were exiled to Louisiana or Louisiana in the 17th century by the British, and Creole, New Orleans itself, a touch of sweetness helps to quench the flames when bone dry wines taste too austere. A little sweetness won't taste syrupy if it's matched by crisp acidity. Try German Rieslings, especially those labeled from the first two categories in the range of semi sweet to sweet. So Cabinet, Spatlese, Aschlese, Baron Aschlese, and Chocken Baron Aschlese. I love that I can say those words and they just roll off my tongue. Moselle region Rieslings in Germany tend to be lighter in body and alcohol and therefore better with these foods than those from, say, the Rhine. For wines from other countries, look for off dry on the label or a sugar coat of one to three as zero is completely dry. Dessert wines are about well, they start anywhere from 5 to 10 and go higher. For this reason, rosé and white Zinfandel also work well. Yes, yes, I said white Zinfandel. That's not an error. These work really well with sweet and sour Chinese sauces and ingredients like pineapple, coconut, and sweetened yogurt. Capsicum is the compound in chilies that makes them hot. It doesn't wreck the wine's flavors, but it does diminish our perception of them. So it's that sensation of, what do they call it? Synesthesia or whatever. You know, if you rub peppermint oil on your neck or anywhere, it feels cool. Or if you eat a mint, if you have a mint, peppermint mint, it feels cool. The mint itself isn't a cold temperature. It's a chemical reaction. It gives the sensation of cooling. Capsicum in chilies has that effect, but it's the heating effect. And so what we want to do is temper down that feeling, perception of heat with cooler wines. My next tip for spicy foods is the heat from spicy dishes not only numbs your palate, that whatever, stenesthesia, probably mispronouncing it, it also creates a stinging sensation when it reacts with alcohol, making the wine feel hotter than it actually is. High alcohol wines are like lighter fluid to a campfire. The flavors of both the wine and the food go up in smoke. Salt, prevalent in soy sauce, oyster sauce, and fish sauces, also accentuates alcohol. So look for lighter bodied wines with an alcohol content of less than 12% if you can. These come from cool climate regions like Germany, Alsace, Canada, because the grapes don't ripen as fully as they do in hotter climes. So my next tip on spicy food and wine is Gewurztraminer, which is harder to pronounce than it is to drink. 
is like liquid salsa to many spicy dishes. The direct translation of the German word Gewürz means spice, which is why maybe it's become the default wine for any spicy dish. However, the wine is more perfumed than it is spicy. Personally, I don't think it deserves such a wide reputation for all spicy dishes. The dry versions I find, but let me know what you think, are often too austere for the wine's assertive aromas of rose petal and lychee nuts. Instead, try exotically perfumed wines from France made from the grapes of Marsan, Viognier, or from California white blends such as Symphony Obsession or Bonnie Dunes, Cal del Solo Malvasia Bianca. I would love to hear what your favorite spicy food wines are. And I would like to come in on the close here on our first topic, cushion your landing. Even though I believe that white wines generally go better with spicy dishes, there are several reds that work, especially round, smooth ones that are like plush cushions to soften the spiciness. These absorb the heat without overwhelming the flavor of the food and work well with mild Indian tandoori, chicken tikka, marsala, and gentler curries. Plummy reds with subtle tannins are ideal, like Chilean Merlot, California Zinfandel, French Beaujolais and Gamay, Pinot Noir from a variety of regions. So I think what you want to avoid in the end are heavy doses of tannin and oak that can mask fruit flavors and acidity in wine and aggravate the perception of heat when you're already eating a hot dish. Tannin and spice are both tactile, but in different ways and tend to rub against each other. One inevitably dominates and diminishes the other. Here's a quick tip. I find chilling my reds to cooler than room temperature makes them better matches for spicy dishes. Just to summarize, why not take a dim sum approach to your choosing your wine? Sample several wines to find the ones you enjoy most. It works for almost all dishes except for howlingly hot dishes, which are too volcanic for any liquid except lava. For these, I recommend water from fire hydrant. <laughs> All right, that's our first topic. Let us get to our next topic. Marketing to Generation X. So I was reading a great article on winesearcher.com by Kathleen Wilcox. I'll credit where credit is due. And I found it fascinating, her insights. Generation X, of course, everybody in the marketing world focuses on the millennials. But Gen X is actually a really important group when it comes to consuming wine and marketing wine to them. So Gen X, of course, revolutionized our culture, as we like to say, and as Kathleen notes, we brought to the fore Nirvana, Tupac, um, <laughs> Amazon, and Tesla, all invented by Gen Xers. And this generation came after baby boomers, but before millennials, sandwiched in between. So it's an interesting group when it comes to wine. Gen X, by the way, is anyone between the ages of 37 and 52, although the edges of those are always fuzzy. It's often overlooked as a group for marketing for wine, but they were born and have had to endure careers during stock market crashes, as Kathleen says. They were born during a period when Americans were having fewer kids Apparently, according to U.S. Census data, there are 65.8 million living Gen Xers around. Boomers are around 74 million. Millennials are 71 million. So you can see how they're kind of the sandwich generation, but they aren't far off the numbers of boomers or millennials. And yet they get written off as a generation. Wine marketing is starting to look at them as a relevant market. In dollars, this article that I'm referring to, Gen X's average order was 13% higher than all other demographics over the past two years. And while sales of millennials have also grown, Gen Xers beat those youngsters by 6% on average. So Gen X is purchasing more and growing faster as wine consumers. Gen X founded 55% of all startups have the highest medium household income, 111,000 purchased the most expensive homes, eat out 
just as much as millennials, spend more on average than anyone else, throw more cash around on vacation. Okay, so they're big spenders. So this article asks, what should the wine industry be doing to attract these, quote, cash-laden, intelligent, non-flashy Gen Xers? Their advice is to seek out those consumers, Gen X consumers, who are interested in stories, not gimmicks. So that makes so much sense, though, to me for any generation. And, you know, I was reading something tonight. Why do we purchase anything? And I think it's because the purchase is a reflection of who we are, but if it's personal to who we are. So there's loads of art in the world, but the last painting I purchased was from somebody here in Ottawa because I know her. And I wasn't just trying to be nice to her, but because it had a story and I felt connected, not just to her, but to the art itself. And so that totally makes sense to me. When it comes to marketing wine, every bottle has a story. And it's the ability of wine marketers to connect that story to these consumers, I think, beyond Gen Xers. Kathleen, in this article, quotes Rachel Martin of San Luis Obispo's Oceano. I don't think of marketing as being generation-specific. The way I'd look at it is it's framed by my experience. Like many Xers, I was a latchkey kid. I'm naturally independent. Our clients, Gen Xers, are less focused on labels with cute animals and variations on seven dirty words as they are what's in the bottle. So again, some very realistic, practical, but non-surprising advice. Quality matters, not a flashy label. Another winemaker says, while we pay attention to boomers and millennials, Gen X is by far our biggest segment today. And we think in the future, they want extremely high quality wines. Wow. Okay. Gen Xers are more likely to buy wine based on established tastes, while millennials are more likely to make purchasing decisions based on trends. Okay, quote from the article. Hmm. We found Gen X is extremely well-educated and engaged with the wine community in the way that baby boomers and millennials aren't necessarily. Very interesting. Boomers are motivated by ratings, Millennials make purchasing decisions through what they see their peers drinking on social media. Gen X is more engaged in knowing the story behind the brand. I love that. That's totally where I'm at. So they're launching video series that really offer a behind-the-scenes access to the story behind the wine. That's smart. Marketing to Gen X. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Now let's get on to our third and final topic. I always love to throw in a study, and it seems one comes out every week. Gives me my material on the regular. So this study, I'm quoting from CNN.com, and it's talking about resveratrol and how it's being used by astronauts. But also it sort of comes around to the fact that resveratrol in red wine has a positive impact on blood pressure and Alzheimer's disease. So they've been testing the effects of resveratrol with astronauts who will be on a mission to Mars and could spend six to nine months in spacecraft without gravity. Our bodies need gravity so that our muscles stay strong, our bone density, even our blood pressure is regulated by gravity. So of course, exercise is important, but they're looking at dietary supplements like resveratrol to endure what could be 50 years of human spaceflight to get to Mars. So they're trying to figure out how to keep people healthy, which is fascinating. So you lose about a percent of bone mass every month when you're in space. So we're talking about if they're in space for 10 to 20 years evolutionarily over a long time, we'd lose our skeleton in space because you don't need it. We'd just become big bags of meat, this article says. My goodness. To endure long-duration missions with no exercise, they need to build in these supplements. They do have an exercise regime and machines on board in the space station, but they're looking toward resveratrol. And a new study has found that resveratrol, the antioxidant and compound found in the skins of wine grapes, 
or grapes, all grapes, could be part of a dietary strategy that keeps astronauts strong on Mars. Resveratrol can be found in red wine because of the grapes used to make it. Interesting. What they're saying is that resveratrol is an anti-inflammatory, an anti-diabetic, and an antioxidant. So that's why it's so powerful for both blood pressure and Alzheimer's. It's fighting off inflammation, diabetes, and oxidation, which are the prime causes of those diseases. They, of course, tried it on rats first and found positive results. Of course, that doesn't always mean it's going to translate to humans, but they're very much looking into that as a way to promote muscle growth in diabetic animals by increasing insulin sensitivity and glucose uptake by the muscle fibers. Anyway, without getting too, too technical there, I find that interesting. So let me know what other topics do you want to cover in the future? I would love to know. I am gearing up to relaunch my Get Wine Smart course this fall. I'm very excited. I'm going to be launching a new webinar about that where I'll be teaching you how to avoid five very prominent food and wine pairing mistakes. So stay tuned for that. I'm so glad you joined me. Bye for now. Well, there you have it. You'll find links to great wines that pair well with spicy dishes and they're in stores right now. My pairing tips, the article on marketing wine to Gen X, and the research study in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 44. So what was your favorite tip or quote from this episode? Please share that with me on Twitter or Facebook and tag me at Natalie McLean. On Instagram, I'm at Natalie McLean Wine. If you like this episode, please tell a friend about it, especially one you know who's interested in pairing wine with spicy dishes or how wine can help with both blood pressure and Alzheimer's. My podcast is easy to find, whether you search Google on its name, on Reserved Wine Talk, or on my name. Finally, if you want to take your ability to pair wine and food to the next level, join me in a free online video class at nataliemclean.com forward slash class. I can't wait to share more wine stories with you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this one. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a terrific wine with a spicy dish of Tex-Mex. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.